Hi, Physical Science students. This is Mrs. Johnson, and we're looking at the handout um, that says Heating and Cooling Curve Review Notes. So today, we're going to be reviewing what we did in the lab last class, hopefully clearing up any issues that you might have had. So let's draw out a heating curve of water, a basic heating curve. On this bottom x-axis, we are going to put uh, time, heat is absorbed. So imagine that you redid the lab from last class, you had your heat, your water on the hot plate, and you were allowing heat to be absorbed over time. On this axis, we recorded the temperature. And this is a heating, we're heating the water up. So we should have seen that we got a graph that looked something um, like a modified version of this. I'm going to draw this in, and I'd like you to draw it on your papers. I'm going to go freehand from here on out and not use a ruler. So let's talk about each of these pieces of our heating curve. We started off with solid water in the solid state, that's ice, and then we heated it until it turned into a liquid, which was this portion of the graph. But the time during which it was melting, our phase change, we should have seen relatively little temperature increase. Once we got our liquid water, um, we began con continued to heat it, and it boiled or evaporated into a gas. And again, as it evaporated, we should have seen relatively little temperature increase. Your graph for the lab probably just looked like these three pieces. You probably didn't have much on either end here, and that's okay. Let's talk about some specifics for water. Your melting temperature for water, you should have seen it melting right around zero degrees Celsius. And then your evaporating temperature, the temperature where the phase change occurred, the flat portion of the graph, we should have seen that happen right around 100 degrees Celsius. So I'm buying some points over here and labeling this 100 degrees Celsius. If we could have done the reverse process and taken gaseous water and cooled it down, what we would have made is a cooling curve of water. So we're going to draw in something that looks like a cooling curve of water, and it would start like this. If we started with a gas, here's our gas, the temperature as we cooled it down would decrease we would see a flattening out as the, a phase change occurred. The temperature would continue decreasing, and then it would flatten out again as a phase change occurred, and the temperature would continue to de decrease further. So on the, the x-axis, we would be looking at time um, cooling occurs. So we're cooling the substance down, heat is being released, and on this axis, we've got temperature in degrees Celsius. So let's label each of our stair steps. We can see that it looks just like a reversed version of the heating curve. So this segment would represent a gas. As the gas cools down, it condenses into a liquid. So this is condensation. As the temperature cools from the liquid phase, we get freezing, and then at that point we have a solid. So one thing to note about the way I've drawn these graphs, if we could number our y-axis over here, our condensation point and our freezing points would look really familiar. The freezing point of the liquid water, the, the temperature at which it goes from liquid to a solid, I'm telling you now it's going to be zero degrees Celsius. And the condensation point is going to be 100 degrees Celsius. These temperatures look, should look really familiar to each other, right? So condensation and evaporation, they're at the same temperature for water. Freezing and melting, they're at the same temperature. It just depends on whether we're cooling it down or increasing the heat and heating it up as to what we call it. So another word for melting temperature, you've heard me say this several times, is melting point. Another word for boiling temperature is boiling point. I want you to be familiar with these, and you should be writing down everything that I write down. The melting and the freezing points for water, check out your graph, melting point, freezing point, they're both at zero degrees Celsius. Why are they the same? 
They're the same because they both represent a transition between the same two phases. Melting is liquid to solid. Freezing is liquid to solid. Excuse me, melting is solid to liquid. But it's the same two phases, right? It just depends on which direction we're going. So they represent a transition between liquid and solid states. We give them two different names, but they're the same exact temperature. So you'll also notice that the condensation and the evaporation point, or the boiling point, is what I'll call that evaporation point, are equal. Same idea here. So this leads me to a really important point for this unit. Every substance, any liquid substance, solid substance you can think of, it's going to have its own characteristic melting and boiling point. That means it will also have the same characteristic freezing and condensation points, but we just tend to call them melting and boiling points. So if we look at this graph here, we've got five different substances listed. You should have heard of carbon monoxide, sodium chloride maybe, hexane and stearic acid are two other chemicals. You'll notice that each one has its melting point listed and its boiling point listed. They're different for every substance because they're not water. Only water boils and melts at zero and hundred. Um, other substances have different melting and boiling points. You could also call these the melting point is always the same as the freezing point. So I'm adding this to my chart. And the boiling point, we could also list it or think of it as the condensation point. This may help you as you go to do the next activity. So if we flip the page, we are going to practice drawing heating and cooling curves. So it says, use the information in the data table. I've given you the same one. Draw labeled temperature versus time graphs for each of the numbered items below. There's four of them. When you draw your curve, you should include particle diagrams to show five particles of substance before and after the change. So we are going to start with stearic acid. It looks like a white, powdery substance at room temperature, 22 degrees Celsius and we're heating it to 150 degrees Celsius. If you were to carry this experiment, what would the graph of temperature versus time look like? You're probably thinking this is a lot. I don't know where to begin. I have given you some steps for starting over here. So the first thing to do is to label your axes and your graph a title. We'll call this heating curve of stearic acid because we're heating the substance. If I were cooling it, I would label it cooling curve on the y x-axis we are going to have time heat is absorbed and we don't have to number this it can be generic and on the y axis we are going to have temperature in degrees celsius just like we've seen now let's take a moment to number the temperature axis this is step one that i've given you over here we are starting at 22 degrees Celsius and heating it up to 150 degrees Celsius. You need to think, how would it make sense to number the y-axis? For my graph, I'm going to start here at 20, and I think I'll number up by tens to get to 150. So 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110. 120, 130, 140, 150 is up here at the top, 160, 170, 180. I went ahead and numbered up to 170. So this gives me most of my graph. Check numbered my temperature axis so that both temperatures listed are included in my numbering. Plot the beginning and the end temperature points. This is step two. So at 22 degrees Celsius, my substance is starting. So I'm going to put a dot at 22 degrees Celsius. So 22 is right around here. And then at the ending, somewhere over here after time has gone by, the substance is 150. So I'm going to put my ending point at 150. Did step two. Step three says plot the points for the phase change. This is the only part that's potentially a little tricky. Stearic acid, if we just heat it up, we're not going to get a straight line from one point to the other if it undergoes a phase change. We know that at phase changes, we get a flattening of the line. The temperature stops changing. So let's figure out where that phase change occurs or if there's a phase change happening. If we go up to our data table, stearic acid says it melts at 80 degrees and boils at 299. 
my, I'm not heating it up to 299 degrees, so I'm not going to be worried about this point, but I am going to heat it past this 80 to temperature mark, right? So I know that at 80 degrees, as it melts, my temperature is going to flat. So I'm just going to pick a spot somewhere in the middle, it doesn't really matter where, and I'm going to draw this flat section, and I'm going to put two points on either side of it. I know that this is where my melting happens, and it's at 80 degrees. I drew it a little too high on my graph, so I'm gonna move it down here. This is incorrect. I'm going to write melting on top of this, just so I know what's happening here. Now that I've got my plots, points plotted, plotted for the phase change, I'm going to connect my dots with lines. So I would use a ruler, if I choose, to connect these two lines or these two points and these two points. Now I can see that my stearic acid is heating up, the temperature flattens out as it melts, and then it heats up again. The last step is to label the sections and draw particle diagrams. If the substance melts here, according to my diagram, over on this side, when it's cooler, it's going to be in the solid phase. And on this side, it's going to be in the liquid phase. And the last thing that I'm going to do is draw the particle diagram. So five particles of the substance. I'm going to draw them with black as black circles. The solid, they're going to be very tightly packed. In the liquid phase, at the end, they're going to be a little more loosely packed. So here's my liquid. Solid is more tightly packed. There's our heating curve for stearic acid. And notice it's just a portion. I'd like you to try the other three on your own.